Good evening and welcome to St. Anthony's Spirituality Center. Thank you for joining us for tonight's presentation on the American Prophets series with Tony Pickler. Tonight's presentation is on Dorothy Day, and I know it's going to be a good one. Um, just a few things to cover before um, we start into the presentation. I'm Adele, the Retreat and Program Coordinator here at St. Anthony's, and we have Tracy that is helping us with the tech support um, and Tony, our presenter. Because we're recording this session um, and Tony is presenting remotely, we ask that all of our Zoom participants keep your videos, or especially your microphones off, which will help with the background noise and a cleaner sounding recording for people who wanna view it down the road. Um, those who are watching virtually will receive an evaluation through your email tomorrow. Um, please fill that out. It helps us to continue to do our best in providing quality programs, but something that you want and that is relevant for you. And those who are here in person, there's an evaluation in front of you and please fill it out for the same reasons. There's no charge for this series, but we are requesting a free will offering donation for those here in person, there is a basket on the front table. And for those who are not here in person, we have a variety of ways you can donate. You can go on our website, on our Facebook page, mail a check-in, call our office, stop in in person. Um, anything that is offered, we greatly appreciate because it, it really makes a difference. We are also continue to be greatly appreciative for the generous grant from the Franciscan Sisters of Perpetual Adoration in La Crosse. This helped us purchase a camera, computer, microphone, and software that allows us to do these virtual presentations that I think we all are enjoying and find them very convenient at times. So we continue to be very grateful for the FSPA Sisters. So tonight we have Tony Pickler He's presenting remotely on Dorothy Day, and he is from the Green Bay Diocese. He is currently the, the Mission Outreach Director for Resurrection Parish in Green Bay. Tony has served the church in various capacities for 35 years, including the Director of the Norbert Teen Center for Spirituality at Norbert Abbey. He has a Master's in Theological Studies from Norbert College. Tony and his wife, Janine, have two children, Andy and Megan, and one grandchild, Jack. So Tony, thank you and welcome again. Thanks, Adele. Uh, good to be back. Um, and it's good to be virtual tonight, as I understand there's some uh, nice snowfall in central Wisconsin and I uh, and think it's coming our way to Green Bay. So uh, thanks for the beauty of Zoom. We are able to do this tonight. Uh, and do it safely. So um, love coming to St. Anthony's Retreat Center or, and Spirituality Center, but uh, sure hope we can get over there in April as we complete this series um, on April 7th. So um, tonight I get the opportunity, the privilege, um, just the unbelievable um, experience of presenting on Dorothy Day, one of my all-time favorite people. I said last time, if I had a Mount Rushmore of people who have influenced my life, um, Thomas Merton would be on that Mount Rushmore, but Dorothy Day's face would probably be one of like the biggest one, right? That she'd be the, the most um, prominent on the mountain because um, uh, she's been most prominent in my, in my life. So I um, want to try to cover her life um, in so many ways tonight through the use of video, through the use of visuals, through the use of discussion, um, and, uh, and of course, through the use of presentation. So um, hopefully, um, I know we have different kinds of learners on, on line tonight and at, at the uh, Spirituality Center. So hopefully one of those ways um, kind of touches your life as well. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, because I want you to see some, uh, some slides that I'll be looking at. Whoops, I got to share this there. There we go. And hit, uh, hit the slide show there. So uh, by the way, here's a couple photos of Dorothy a little bit later in life, of course, the one on the, um, the far um, far left uh, corner 
is Dorothy um, pretty late in life. She died in 1980. And so that I'm guessing that's in the late, probably the late seventies. And um, the photo in the upper right, I, I would imagine was probably also taken in the, in the seventies at some point, but um, just two of my favorite photos of her very, um, very intense looks uh, in her face and just um, uh, kind of a weathered look, of course, um, because she had 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 a long, graceful, uh, beautiful life um, by that time. So um, just as a reminder, if you were here for the Thomas Merton presentation, um, the people that we're talking about in this series, um, the American Prophets series, uh, come from a book by the same title in uh, the American Prophets. And so um, uh, this Dorothy is one of the featured people in that book. And that's why tonight's presentation, I entitled Dorothy Day, an American prophet, because I truly believe she, she was. Um, it's also ironically um, today, the memorial of St. Scholastica. Um, if any of you are familiar with St. Scholastica, she was the sister of St. Benedict. Um, and so today should remind us that we're kind of Benedictine in a lot of ways. And I know Dorothy, uh, Dorothy Day was definitely um, influenced by Benedictine spirituality and by the Benedictines, particularly where I went to school at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota. She had a direct relationship with the monks at St. John's. And, um, and so in her heart and in her soul, and I think in her bones, um, she was she was Benedictine. Uh, so today, as we celebrate the uh, Memorial of Saint Scholastica, and we remember Dorothy Day, I wanted to start out um, by by doing something that you may not be familiar familiar with. Um, some of you might be familiar with Lexio Divina, which is um, divine reading or sacred reading. Uh, Lexio Divina is a contemplative reading of scripture where typically there would be four steps to it, four stages, where you'd read the same scripture passage four times, and at each stop along the way, um, do something different with it, kind of, uh, contemplate it, uh, pray about it, think about it, etc. So um, a lot of you might have experienced Lexio Divina, heard about Lexio Divina, but tonight I want to explore with you um, as we get into the topic of Dorothy Day and we begin in prayer, um, Visio Divina. Visio Divina is divine seeing. So instead of Laxio Divina, divine reading, Visio Divina is divine seeing. And so it's, it's looking at something, at an image, at a piece of art, um, and trying to experience God, just as we do in scripture with divine reading, Laxio Divina, through the, through the visual, we can also experience God. So I'm going to show you a, um, uh, a, a, a sketch that was done by a, um, a really good friend of Dorothy Day. Um, and I'm going to flip the slide here. And this is called um, Christ in the Bread Lines by Fritz Eichenberg. Eichenberg was the artist who is most responsible for just about every image in the Catholic Worker newspaper for many of its years, not all of them. Uh, there's other folks that, uh, that have also contributed to the artwork in it, but he did a number of different sketches. So what I want you to do is look, contemplate, look at this sketch by Eichenberg called Christ in the Bread Lines. Contemplate it for a moment. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you some directions and I'm gonna come back to this, okay? So you kind of got the, the feel of this, of this piece, okay? So just hang on to that for a second, we'll come back. I want you to look at the people in that bread line. And I want you to pick out the person that most resonates with you. And if you can, Give that person a name. You know, there's always something about relationship. Dorothy was all about relationship. People that came to the houses of hospitality, uh, people that she encountered on retreats, she was all about relationships. People at the farms, give the person a name in relationship. And then try to imagine what might that person's story be? What do you think that person's story is? How'd they get to that breadline? 
All right, so pick out a person, give the person a name. What might that person's story be? I'm gonna come back to the, to the paint, to the sketching and just give it a few moments for you to contemplate. If we were all in person tonight, I'd take some time and we'd have some discussion about, about who you chose, how you name that person, and then what story you, you would tell about that person. So I guess for tonight, as we um, uh, deal with the magic of, of technology, uh, we'll just have to hold that in our hearts and, um, and uh, maybe have a conversation with yourself as you bring that to prayer tonight who that person was and maybe pray for the people who are in bread lines this very day in our country and in places all over the world. Knowing that as Dorothy believed and as Fritz believed, Jesus, the Christ, is in the poor, is in the midst of the poor, standing in line with the poor. Christ in the Breadlines. If you get a chance, check out Fritz Eichenberg, check out his artwork. He's also got another great piece called The Peaceable Kingdom uh, that I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, um, but yeah, I think you'd also find meaning in that as well as many of his other uh, pieces of art. So that's our contemplation. So when I think of Dorothy Day, I think of a puzzle. And I don't know about you, but you know, I love doing puzzles, but um, I, I like puzzles that I can, you know, accomplish in a reasonable amount of time, right? So right now we have a two and a half year old grandchild, Jack, over in Minnesota, and uh, he's dealing with puzzles that are about 20 pieces. Well, I'll tell you what, as many times as I do puzzles with Jack and usually do them over and over and over again, the same puzzle, I can almost memorize those pieces and put them together in about three minutes, right? Dorothy Day's life was not a 20 piece puzzle. Uh, it wasn't that easy. It was a lot more complicated than that. And so um, I look at her as like a thousand piece puzzle. I mean, there's a lot of pieces and a lot of complication and, and there's, there's just a lot of a lot of stuff there, right? A lot of history, a lot of a lot of good and you know, quite frankly, some challenges as well. So tonight we're not going to be able to cover a thousand pieces. We, you know, this would have to be a three-day retreat if we were doing that. But um, instead, we're going to cover just um, a number of them. Okay, so um, not a thousand, but you know, we'll we'll get as many as we can in. So the first um, puzzle piece is um, what, it, or I would say, the overall picture we're trying to get first of all is this picture of Dorothy being on pilgrimage. And ironically, you'll see in a minute that her column that appeared in the Catholic Worker newspaper for many, many, many years, for decades actually, was called On Pilgrimage because that's the way she viewed her life as a, as a pilgrimage, as a, as a journey that um, you know, had a beginning of course, but had a lot of different twists and turns and stops and starts. Um, and, and it wasn't a straight line. It was definitely not a straight line. So Dorothy was on pilgrimage. One of her, um, one of a, a quotes by Father Jim Martin that has been uh, you know, spoken of about Dorothy is this, and this is from his book, My Life with the Saints, which is a great book, by the way. I uh, really highly recommend it. He said, and this truly is about Dorothy as well, sometimes the most grateful pilgrim is the one whose road has been the rockiest. And Dorothy Day's life and her road and her pilgrimage was certainly a rocky road at some points. And so um, 
I want to turn to Father Jim, as we did last time for um, Thomas Merton, because he's done a really nice job of summarizing Dorothy Day's life. Now, this video is probably, I don't know, 10 years old. Jim, Jim's hair is a lot less right now and a lot grayer, if you've seen him recently. He's a Jesuit priest out in New York City. Uh, has written a number of books, including uh, My Life with the Saints. So here's Father Jim Martin's um, take on Dorothy Day's life. And it's kind of a, a really good overview of the life. So let's, let's give it a listen. So a very good, I think, um, summary of Dorothy's life. So now I kind of want to fill in the pieces a little bit, right, with these puzzle pieces that we have. And the, um, the first piece is what I call a childhood of trauma. Um, because as you're going to see, I think Dorothy certainly... Uh, lived through some trauma in her early early years. So as Father Jim already said, she was born in New York, in Brooklyn, New York, uh, 1897, no, November 8th. So if we want to remember her birthday, it's, it's on that day, November 8th. Um, she had two older brothers and a younger sister, and she moved around a lot. So I don't know if any of you on this call have moved around when you were a child or in your high school years, um, but that can be traumatic. I personally, I was sharing with somebody before this um, uh, as we were just getting on the call that I moved while I was in high school from Eau Claire to Marshfield and um, it was junior in high school and that that was pretty darn traumatic as all those relationships I had in Eau Claire um, had a change and, uh, and in some cases cease and new relationships had to um, be developed. So um, Dorothy moved um, quite a bit as a child from Brooklyn to Berkeley, California to Chicago and then eventually back to New York. So um, uh, a little, little traumatic, I would say, for a, a, a young, a young child. He also went through the San Francisco earthquake, and um, imagine how traumatic that is. Now, just check this. Um, this, there's a lot of print on the slide, but I'll read it for you. Uh, the earthquake occurred in the early morning. Dorothy was lying in a brass bed when it began vibrating and rolling across the room. Her father quickly grabbed her brothers and ran towards the door. Her mother grabbed Dorothy's sister Della. Dorothy was left alone in the bed. It took a few moments before Dorothy's parents could get back to her. She didn't remember feeling afraid. What she remembered most about the event was the warmth that she felt as she witnessed people come together in the aftermath of the quake. And even though that last line, you know, kind of brushes it over a little bit and, and talks about the, the aftermath of the quake, I can't imagine the trauma that would have been caused in a young child as this earthquake is, you know, crumbling things around you and your brothers and uh, sister are, are, you know, being saved by your parents and yet you're left alone um, to try to fend for yourself. So um, traumatic, um, traumatic early, early life there. So she goes on the University of Illinois, Father Jim said, but she only went through two years. Um, she, she left after two years. So she was not a, even though she was an avid reader and a really, really good writer, um, she didn't like school all that much and, um, and decided to leave and not finish her degree. So uh, for being uh, the most, uh, most uh, incredible Catholic Christian of the 20th century, um, she had, you know, um, a couple of years of college, but never finished that up. She bounced around as a journalist um, for a number of different publications. And, and by most accounts, if you would read her journals, if you read her biographies, um, most people would say those early years, she was, she was an anarchist. I mean, she was looking to, um, you know, to, to see how the government could be changed and maybe even overthrown. Another traumatic experience for her was in 1917. So uh, there was some um, protests going on to picket uh, women's suffrage, uh, the, the women's right to vote. And um, so she went to Washington DC to cover that for the, um, for the publications that she was working for. But while there, she herself got thrown into jail. It was the first time she'd ever been in jail. Now, <laughs> later in her life, she was jailed a number of times. Right. And, at, you know, get to a point where she was probably getting a little used to it. But that first time, that first time in 1917, uh, just as before the First World War, um, traumatic experience for her and really changed the course in so many ways of her life. 
to really identify with those who are in prison, identify with those who are on the margins, uh, identify with those who are going through some tough times. So 1917 is kind of a watershed year in her life um, and, a, and a pretty traumatic time for her. So puzzle piece number two, young adult conversion. Now, I just want to preface this by saying I've read a couple of things lately where um, some of the leaders of the Catholic Church, some of the bishops are really focusing on her conversion when it comes to the cause for her sainthood. Um, and right now she's a servant of God, um, marching towards beatification, we hope, and then eventually marching towards uh, canonization. But um, some of the leaders of our church are really zeroing in on the conversion, which is it's just good, you know, right? It's a, it's a good story, as you'll see, and you heard Father Jim talk about a bit, but it's not the only thing. And in, in fact, by focusing so much on her conversion, sometimes we take away from the incredible ministry that she did and the incredible voice she had for peace and for um, uh, uh, being against the war, uh, wars in her lifetime, uh, being against nuclear arms. So she had some incredible causes that she was standing for. And yes, her conversion is an experience, but not um, it's not the be all and end all. I just kind of wanted to kind of frame that a little bit. It's important, but it's 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 not everything. Okay, so um, so you remember 1917? She's in jail, right? So she has this kind of this conversion experience of that uh, towards uh, people on the margins. Um, but in 1918, she had this relationship with a man named uh, Lionel Mose, as uh, as Father Jim alluded to, and, and it was in that relationship that she became pregnant. And Lionel wasn't going to um, allow for this child to be born. And so Dorothy um, decided to have the abortion uh, to end this child's life. Um, and it's uh, that, that decision and that regret and that guilt and everything that came with it um, later in large part sparked her conversion uh, to Catholicism, to Christianity. So um, some people will point right here, 1918, 1919, as some years that should say, well, you know, if you've had an abortion, how could you ever be considered a saint? Um, but as you're going to see, and as, as many church leaders would also agree, it's the totality of her life and the conversion she had and what she stood for and what she did uh, for the rest of her life that we marked towards sainthood. So, um, so after that experience with Lionel, then she has a really quick, I hate to say it this way, but a quick fling uh, with this guy by the name of Berkeley Toby. And they traveled throughout Europe and um, uh, got married, um, but then, got divorced right away. So she wasn't married to that guy more than a, a year or 18 months. Um, and then they were divorced. So just like last time we talked about Thomas Burton and how his early life was kind of, kind of um, topsy-turvy, you know, a little, little wild, little, um, you know, a little unsettled. Dorothy Day's life is probably even more so. Um, and the fact that she had these relationships and that she had the abortion and that she uh, got married and got divorced and all of the stuff going on in her life. Um, so just a, a really unsettled early part of her life. Um, then in 24, 1924, she meets this guy who she spent a lot of years with, uh, Forster uh, Batterham, and, um, and they spent so much time, uh, so many years together that they're considered common law uh, husband and wife. And so um, uh, and together, they have a child. And um, the problem is, and the child's name is Tamar, and, and she was born in 1926. The problem is that Forster was definitely, he was very much of a, um, of a non-believer, right? Uh, very much of an atheist. And so when Dorothy decided to have Tamar baptized in 1927, Forster couldn't deal with that. Um, he that was against his kind of like his personal religion, shall we say. And so um, it was because of that that baptism that there was a split that that he could not 
be with Dorothy anymore, um, having made that decision. In the process, Dorothy had also become baptized. So she got her daughter baptized. She herself became baptized in 1927. Um, and then uh, it was with all of that that Forster said, you know, I'm out of here. This, this is it's not going to work for us. And so she, Dorothy then went, went it alone for the rest of her life. Um, and I always, I always, uh, I just go back for a sec. I always think about a couple of people who've had similar kinds of conversion experiences. I think of St. Augustine, I think of St. Norbert, who I, I used to work uh, with the Norbertines over here. And um, uh, both of those guys had these tremendous conversion experiences. Well, Dorothy had one too, right? So um, in, that, in those early years, those rough years, those drinking years, those relationships, the abortion, uh, marriage, breakups, um, all of that, she had a pretty rough and tumble early life, early teen years, young adult years, and then um, in those later 20s, kind of pulled her life together, similar to St. Augustine, similar to, to St. Norbert. So um, a story of conversion, a story of metanoia, changing changing your life, uh, making a, a, a turnaround in your life. Um, but, you know, again, just as I started by saying, that's not the only the only thing that makes Dorothy Day a model of our faith, okay? So we get to um, little piece number three, Peter Morin and the beginnings of the Catholic worker movement. So Dorothy met Peter in 1932. It's the heart of the depression, right? So the, you had, the, um, you had the, uh, the start of the depression in 1929. A few years later, you're right in the heart of it. And uh, there's food lines, there's poverty, there's unemployment, there's there's uh, all kinds of unrest. And it was in the midst of that, in that context, that um, Dorothy met Peter Morin. Um, Peter sought out Dorothy because he'd read some of her articles in Commonweal, which is still a, a very um, well-respected uh, publication in the United States, and was really taken by her philosophy, her way of writing, her stance towards the person on the margins. And he himself, having come from France and then kind of through Canada, having uh, spent some time with the Christian brothers, um, he had been struck by Catholic social teaching in those early days of, of uh, Pope Leo XIII and Ray Room Navarro and uh, the first uh, uh, social encyclical in 1891. Uh, he read that, kind of took that into his heart, and he was on the look for somebody to help him to actualize Catholic social teaching in action. Um, I think Peter probably recognized the fact that he was kind of a philosopher. He was a, he was a thinker. He probably wasn't going to be able to person could be able to be the person to like pull together a movement built on Catholic social teaching. But he had to find somebody who was and could do that. And what he did was he found Dorothy Day. He was 55 years old. She was 26 uh, when they first met, and they formed a relationship that, I mean, literally changed the changed the world. So, um, it was this merging of two people who believed that living your faith was done through social outreach, through the works of mercy, and so he convinced Dorothy to take that philosophy and to start a newspaper. Now, can you imagine, you have a young woman who's got journalism background, has this new vision of, of how to live as a Catholic Christian with this social consciousness, meets this guy who says, hey, why don't you start a newspaper? It's like, it's like putting you know, um, uh, some gasoline to the fire and, and just watching the explosion. And so she did. She, she started a newspaper, and uh, the first edition was sold in Union Square in New York on uh, May 1st, which is, um, you know, St. Joseph the Worker um, feast day in 1933, and it was sold for a penny. And guess how much a Catholic worker newspaper today is sold for? A penny. So um, it was through, you know, a penny, and obviously 1933 was probably worth a little bit more than uh, 2020. Um, but in 2021, but um, 
but still it was a penny. And so with those funds, and they and they sold a lot of a lot of newspapers, as you can see, uh, Paulus Press printed them and 2,500 copies, and that number just mushroomed uh, unbelievably. They took all of those pennies and put them together so they could do some other some other ministries. Here's a here's a copy of the Catholic Worker newspaper. Uh, this one's dated 1936. Um, I always love the front cover on this one, just saying, "Yes, I am a radical." And I think I think Dorothy Day would, um, you know, would have said, "Yeah, she, was, she had some radical thoughts too." So April 1936. So the paper had been going just a few years by the time that this this particular edition came out. So. Um, so she began, Dorothy began to write a column in a newspaper originally called The Listener and then changed it to day by day and then day after day. But then in 1946, her column became known as On Pilgrimage. And as Father Jim alluded to, that's the way she saw her life, that her life was a pilgrimage and that she was on pilgrimage. And she wrote that column from um, the, the earliest days of the Catholic Worker newspaper until she died in 1980. And when you put those columns all together, you get a picture of her life and what she was dealing with and her thoughts and her prayers and, and everything got poured into, into, the, into that column. And so um, for the first six months, that's all the Catholic worker was, was a newspaper. But like I said, Peter Morin was a philosopher. He was a... He was a thinker. And so he knew that he had more ideas than just having Dorothy write a newspaper. He had, he had visions of, of bringing social teaching alive. And two of the people that he um, kind of centered his thoughts on or, or derived his thoughts from were St. Basil the Great, St. Basil's um, uh, theory or philosophy of creating the city of hospitality where if if there was a coat in your closet that coat belongs to the poor i always I always think of the saint basil the great some quote it kind of goes along with that scripture passage of you know if you have two coats in your closet you should be given one to the poor right and i look at my closet and i go oh boy i you know i could divest myself of you know a lot um every coat in that closet of mine according to St. Basil Gray, belongs to the poor. That's the kind of philosophy that Peter Morin brought to the Catholic worker uh, movement. And then St. Jerome um, was the first to have this concept of a Christ room, that every person's home should have a room dedicated to the poor. So that if somebody came to your door, very Benedictine, by the way, because this is the way Benedictine uh, abbeys operated through the centuries and to a point to this very day, right? That when a person comes to your door and is in need of hospitality, in need of, of housing, in need of a room to stay, in need of a meal, there should be a Christ room where they are welcomed, where they can stay. Now, how many of us have a Christ room? Um, I'm going to guess on this call, maybe nobody, right? But, but that's where Peter Morin was getting his vision from was people like St. Basil the Great and St. Jerome and, and trying to form. So what would that look like in the 1930s? So um, what happened then was that he convinced Dorothy to open her apartment on 15th Street, New York as a house of hospitality. And so she did. And um, it was a simple movement of, of if somebody needed a place to stay, her place was available. Well, you could imagine that in a small apartment on 15th Street in New York City, um, that couldn't last very long. So in 1936, they moved to 115 Mott Street, where it stayed there for a number of years. And what happened was those, those very early years, even within the first year of the first house hospitality in 1936, um, 33 houses around the country sprang up. So can you imagine that, the, the, the wildfire nature of this thing, that um, people got word that this woman, Dorothy Day, was opening her place as a house of hospitality, and couldn't we do that in Chicago? Couldn't we do that in St. Louis? 
Couldn't we do that in New Orleans? Couldn't we do that in Los Angeles? And so places all over the country um, started to form. So much so, I'm kind of fast forwarding to the end of the story, but um, to this day, there are about 250 Catholic worker houses spread across the country. So, um, so that's every house of hospitality was not, not one of them is the same, nor is it today, right? They, there's no cookie cutter approach to them. Um, but the bottom line is that every person is welcomed as Christ at the door. Every person welcomed as created in the image and likeness of God as the Imago Dei when they come to the door. That's what Peter believed. That's what Dorothy Day believed. Now, Peter not only believed, this guy is a thinker. <laughs> so he needed somebody to be able to put all these thoughts into action. Not only did he believe that there should be a newspaper, which would lead money, lend money towards houses of hospitality and these communities uh, where people were welcomed, but that there would be a communing, communal farming nature uh, element to his, um, his vision. And he called it the Green Revolution, that, that people would be welcome to work the land and to, in that way, um, have a place to live, food to eat, a community of support. And as he believed, and as we all know, if anybody has farming background, um, there's no unemployment on the farm because there's always work to be done, right? Um, and so he believed that these farms could be, could be created all over the country to welcome people who were poor for a place to be, a place to work, a place to live together, a place to eat together. And so they've, they started the first one on Staten Island in New York. And, um, and again, from there, many farms sprang up and they're still to this day, Catholic worker farms. I know of one just uh, south of us down in Iowa um, that's very productive and very um, uh, just doing really great stuff. That, that whole notion comes from, as we began this uh, talk, from Benedictine spirituality, right? So there, there would be a, this balance between um, work and prayer, prayer and work. Um, Dorothy was influenced by Benedictine spirituality. Peter was um, influenced by that, that balance between work and prayer, uh, between community and, and working the land or, or uh, working wherever we, we work. Um, so Benedictine spirituality is kind of at a core of everything that Peter and, and Dorothy um, believed in. So we get to puzzle piece number four. We're on number four already. Um, her spirituality. Dorothy believed that a person's spirituality should be based in thirds. That a third of a person, so we think of Dorothy Day as all work, right? That she provided meals, she provided housing, she provided these houses of hospitality, she provided uh, these, these communal farms. She did, it was all do, 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 right? That she was always working, but she's very Benedictine. She's very much about balance. So she believed that she strived for, I'm not gonna say she ever necessarily attained it all the time, but she believed in this life of thirds, that a third of your life, a third of the day, would be spent in prayer. And she did. She began every day with um, uh, praying the divine office, like monks do and uh, priests and deacons and many lay people do, um, praying the divine office, daily mass attender, always attended mass uh, wherever she was, and, um, and spent time in, in other forms of prayer as well. A third of her life in prayer a third in study and meditation. She was a great reader. She read all kinds of uh, novels and theolo theological works and uh, biographies and you name it, she read it, right? She was a voracious reader. Um, so a third of it should be in study and meditation. And then a third in the care of human beings and the business of life. Now think about that. If we all, um, you know, <laughs> We all attain that. Um, our lives would probably look a lot different. I know my life doesn't look like third, third, third. That's for sure. Um, so um, again, attend a daily mass, 
uh, prayed the Psalms every day through the divine office. And she also had this, this really incredible link with the monks over at, at St. John's Abbey, as I kind of pointed out before. Um, but interestingly enough, this was the time period where they were beginning to um, form the basis of a new liturgical renewal, where liturgy would be linked with social justice and social justice with liturgy. And those thoughts in the 40s and 50s laid the foundation uh, for Vatican II and the changes that happened at Vatican II. So in some, in some small way, Dorothy Day, in her connections to the, to the um, Benedictines over at St. John's, influenced the work of Vatican II. We get to puzzle piece five, her relationships. Dorothy was a person of relationships. And I'll tell you, if you get a chance, go down to Marquette University. If you're ever in Milwaukee and you can spend a couple, two, three hours at, at Marquette, go to the library at Marquette. Uh, the I think it's called the Ragar Library. And um, Dorothy Day's archives are there. And um, all you got to do is say, uh, you know, I... I when I, I've been there three times, and each time I just call in advance, tell them I'd like to see some of the archives. They'll uh, they'll ask what kind of archives you want to see, and you kind of tell them what you're looking for, and they'll set you up with whatever you want. Um, I have seen some incredible pieces down at the at the Dorothy Day archives uh, down in Marquette. What's interesting about these archives is that um, you are handling the actual pieces, the letters, the books, the manuscripts, all of it, not, not copies, not like cheap uh, facsimiles. These are like the actual letters. So here I am holding a letter that she wrote to Thomas Merton, you know, and here's a letter that Thomas Merton wrote to her. And you're, you're actually, you know, you have the letters. <clears throat> so here, uh, just some of the relationships and they're found in these letters at, uh, at Marquette. This is uh, Kathleen de Huck Doherty, who founded a similar um, house that Dor like as Dorothy did in, in New York. Uh, Catherine founded a similar house up in Toronto uh, called Friendship House. And so uh, Dorothy and Catherine had this really interesting and great relationship because they were all about the same thing, right? They're about forming these houses of hospitality. And in this case, in Catherine's case, just called something different. So Catherine de Huck Doherty is a, is a really uh, influential uh, 20th century Catholic in her own right. And, um, and they had a really great relationship. Zeichenberg um, is that artist that um, we started this talk with. And so here's one of um, his letters written to Dorothy. And you can see at the very top, he, he you know, sketched out something. It's not just a letter. It's a piece of, it's a piece of art is what it is. Um, and so again, if you go to the archives, you can sit and read these letters. Um, it's just, it's, it's, a, it's quite an opportunity. And again, this is the Christ in the Bread Lions piece from Fritz. <clears throat> Here's a letter from Dorothy to Fritz. What I appreciate about this is that um, Dorothy doesn't have, you know, the nice artistic sketch up above, but what she does is she draws this little fish down below. Uh, much love, Dorothy, with a little fish. And it's something that, you know, maybe a, I don't know, a third grader might put together or something, but uh, it was just her little way of, I'm sure, saying, you know, well, Fritz, I got a little, I got a little art in me too. So here you go. Um, so that's so this relationship between Fritz and Dorothy, as Fritz was such a contributor to the to the Catholic worker amazing. The Berrigan brothers, um, Daniel and Phil, also good friends of Dorothy. Um, so here's a, a letter from Father Phil uh, to to Dorothy. Uh, and then here is one from Daniel, Daniel Berrigan to Dorothy. So these relationships, I mean, Thomas Merton had them as well, right? These, these written communications to, to famous people that, that we're familiar with um, all over the world. Here's Thomas Merton. Um, so this is Thomas typing a letter to Dorothy and then, and then uh, at the bottom signing his name. Um, but, uh, you know, again, a great relationship. Here's a handwritten, uh, you can see the letterhead at the top, Abbey of Gethsemane in Kentucky. 
handwritten letter from uh, from Thomas Merton to Dorothy Day. So they wrote often. This piece is a, um, a telegram from Thomas Merton to Dorothy Day. And Thomas, you know, good friends can, can, um, can, can be honest with one another. And in this case, Thomas was not happy with Dorothy. Um, there was a Catholic worker who um, in um, protesting the war, uh, the Vietnam War, um, poured gas on himself and lit himself on fire. And Tom, Thomas Merton really didn't feel like a peace movement had um, room in it for something like that. So on Roger Laporte, the man's name was Roger Laporte, when he lit himself on fire, Thomas took Dorothy to task for that. And, um, and I guess that's what good friends can do is, is call each other to the truth. So really great relationships. If you, again, if you get a chance, um, go down to the, go down to the um, the archives down at Marquette because they're just incredible. I spent hours down there till my eyes can't read anything anymore, and then I have to leave um, because Dorothy wrote so much. You know, she's got all these letters, but she's also got fifteen hundred articles. She's got six books. Uh, probably the most famous of them would have been um, the House Hospitality, which kind of just laid out her vision of what what house, house, houses of hospitality would be. Um, Pilgrimage, um, another, another famous book, kind of compiles some of her thoughts from her, um, uh, it's, it's her biography, right? As well as Long Loneliness and Loaves and Fishes. These are all like uh, fundamental work written by Dorothy. Um, so six books, 1500 articles. This was the manuscript for the Long Loneliness. I, <laughs> This is down at the archives in Marquette, at Marquette. So I took this out of a, out of a, a Manila envelope, pulled it out, and here's the original manuscript for a long, long way. So you can see the address uh, handwritten there, 115 Mott Street. That's where she was living at the time in the Catholic Worker House there. Um, but check the, you know, the coffee stains that are dripped on the cover of this thing. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. You can't have food or drink in the archives, but what, what always amazes me when I go there is, is that you can actually handle these, um, these important documents and, uh, and not think anything of it. So, um, so this is the, the manuscript from one of those six books. Then we have some, uh, have some quotes to, um, to uh, go over for you. Um, so the first one is this. And this is, the, this is where the Long Loneliness um, book uh, title came from. We have all known the Long Loneliness. As, as Father Jim said, it's our life, right? We all have this loneliness in our life. And we have learned that the only solution is love. And that love comes with community. So Dorothy believed that people are meant to live in community, in relationship with one another. That's how Christianity is lived out. And so that's why she developed uh, the um, houses of hospitality, the Catholic worker houses, is because people needed to live in community. <clears throat> Excuse me. She said, I firmly believe that our salvation depends on the poor. Isn't that a challenging quote there? That our salvation depends on how we, we outreach to the poor, which leads right into Matthew 25, right? You know, I was hungry, you gave me food, I was thirsty, you gave me drink, et cetera, et cetera. That salvation of ours depends on how well we've done that, how well we uh, fed the poor, how well we gave drink to the thirsty, how well we visited the imprisoned or comforted the sick, uh, welcomed the stranger, right? So um, challenging quote, but it's, you know, built right, right in, uh, from the scriptures. Um, I got some issues here with where the, I got to, Get rid of my, there we go, I'll do it that way. Um, people say, what's the sense of our small effort? They cannot see that we must lay one brick at a time, we'll take one step at a time. A pebble cast into a pond causes ripples that spread in all directions. Each one of our thoughts, words, and deeds is like that. No one has the right to sit down and feel hopeless. There's too much work to do. I think that's really amazing. I mean, Mother Teresa had the exact same kind of philosophy of what can you do in all of this complexity of poverty and homelessness and, uh, you know, all of that? 
what, what can we do? It's so big, it's so immense, it's so complex. Well, how about do, do something? Like just lay one brick, take one step, do one thing, and then maybe you take the next step and do the next thing. But the first thing is to just do, do something. Um, love that quote from Dorothy Day. Another one, the gospel takes away our right forever to discriminate between the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. I love this quote because of especially my time um, having been a co-founder of a homeless shelter here in Green Bay, St. John's uh, Homeless Shelter. I heard over and over again in the shelter, you know, these people... Um, I just don't know if they they deserve you know this meal. I don't know if if they deserve this bed. I don't you know there's like this we deserve something and and those poor poor people you know are they really deserving? Well, Dorothy's like you know what the gospel the gospel that tells us that the last shall be first, the first shall be last, and uh, we are we are to serve not to be served. That the gospel takes away the right to discriminate between deserving and undeserving. It's like, hey, we'll let God figure that out, right? So everybody based uh, in the fact that they're, they're creating the image and likeness of God deserve love, right? Deserve dignity. Um, the greatest challenge of the day is how to bring about a revolution of the heart. I love that term, the revolution of the heart. A revolution which, which has to start with each one of us. When we begin to take the lowest places to wash the feet of others, to love our brothers and sisters with that burning love, that passion which led to the cross, then we can truly say, now I have begun. A revolution, a revolution of love, washing the feet of others. I love that quote as well. How necessary it is to cultivate a spirit of joy. You can kind of hear Pope Francis in this a little bit. It's a psychological truth that the physical acts of reverence and devotion make one feel devout. The courteous gesture increases one's respect for others. To act lovingly is to begin to feel loving. And certainly to act joyfully brings joy to others, which in turn makes one feel joyful. I believe we're called to the duty of delight. And in fact, that, that last phrase there, the duty of delight, that is the title of a, a compilation of her um, diaries, her journals uh, put together. It's called The Duty of Delight. Um, I'm gonna show you a video clip here in a second. And, and uh, she, she talks about this. We were just sitting there talking when Peter Moran came in. We we're just sitting there talking when lines of people began to form saying, we need bread. Think about 1933. We could not say, go thou, be thou filled. If there were six small loaves and a few fishes, we had to divide them. There was always bread. So love that. People need bread. You can't say, just go thou be filled. You need to feed them, right? You need to feed them. And then uh, lastly, last quote here, um, probably our most famous one kind of gets a little overblown maybe sometimes, but she said at one point, don't call me a saint. I don't want to be dismissed so easily. Well, Guess what? She's on the march towards becoming a saint. And uh, at this point, she's a servant of God. And like I said, hopefully moving towards the edification. And then um, hopefully right after that, uh, looking at, at canonization at some point down the line here. Um, so we have, oh, I want to just, uh, puzzle piece number seven, a social mystic. You know, we believe a mystic to be a person who has an experience of God, right? Not just a head trip but uh, uh, knowing stuff about God or about Jesus, but having an experience of the holy, of the divine. Um, and a lot of people have called Dorothy a social mystic. She had an experience of God through people, especially people on the margins. So I always thought that was kind of an interesting way to speak about her. So I want to show you a real a video clip. I won't watch the whole thing, but um, this is from a, a show, I think in the 70s, probably early, maybe late 60s, early 70s. And um, it's pretty rough. <laughs> you know, it's pretty, uh, it's, the production's pretty rough. But the, you don't get the chance to hear the person speak um, too often, especially if they're uh, hopefully a future saint. So I want you to at least just get a little sense of 
how did Dorothy speak, the intensity that she speaks with, um, the, the reverence she speaks with, um, uh, just, just to get a sense of who she is through her own voice, as we, just as we did with Thomas Merton last time. This is Dorothy Day. There's gonna be a little bit of an introduction. Unfortunately, it'd be hard to get through that. So I'll let you just kind of watch the introduction as well. <laughs> Told you it's early production TV here. Christopher Close-Up, a look at the people who are shaping tomorrow's world today. Hello, I'm Edward Blake. Welcome to Christopher Close-Up. I'm Jean Glenn. I'm Richard Armstrong. Since the beginnings of human history, man has been a maker of war and a dreamer of peace. While he has devoted his energy, talents, and resources to the development and use of weapons of self-destruction, he's done comparatively little to discover effective methods for the making and keeping of peace. Our guest has been actively working for peace for nearly half a century. She's the co-founder of the Catholic Worker Movement, the author of several books, among them Loaves and Fishes, The Long Loneliness and Meditation. And she's the widely traveled lecturer, Miss Dorothy Day. With her is a former editor of the Catholic Worker newspaper and present executive secretary of the Catholic Peace Fellowship, Mr. Tom Cornell. Ms. Day, uh, how and when did the Catholic Worker Movement begin? <clears throat> I think there was a war going on at the time it began between China and Japan back in 1933. And it began uh, through the, the efforts of Peter Morin, a French peasant, who was a former teacher in the Christian Brothers schools in Paris, who felt a call to come to America and be part of the really build up a lay apostolate and he came to me because he read articles that I'd written about the social order and suggested we start the Catholic Worker newspaper. What was your first reaction when he came with this idea? My first reaction was that uh, I'd like nothing better than to, I think it's the ambition of everybody who's been in journalism to have their own paper, to start a paper but I was very dubious about the funds but he said in the Catholic Church, funds were never necessary. You just needed to start. <laughs> <laughs> and we found it worked that way. Well, you began uh, with the Catholic Worker, the, the newspaper, but this got you into all sorts of other involvements with people. We began talking about what makes for peace, and that is the teaching in the Gospels, the Beatitudes, the Sermon on the Mount, and so on. And to take them literally really meant that you began practicing the works of peace rather than the works of war. And the works of war are the exact opposite of the works of peace. Feeding the hungry when we are destroying crops and sheltering the homeless when we are destroying villages, wiping out cities. It's all the way through, right down the line, the opposite. And Christ proposed certainly that the work of the Christian was the works of mercy. And he laid it down as commands, not counsels, in the 25th chapter of St. Matthew. There's no better way to get into trouble than to try to make peace, is there? I always say if you start praying and saying, Lord, what will you have me do? Uh, prayers are answered and you find yourself doing a lot more than you ever thought you were going to do, getting yourself involved. Miss Day, as a student, the first thing I heard about the So I know uh, due to time, I, that's about as much of that clip as we'll probably be able to watch. But um, if you ever get a chance, just Google uh, Dorothy Day. Um, uh, go to YouTube, more likely. Go to Dorothy Day, and you'll see that, see that clip, and you can watch it in its entirety. Um, Lastly, I just want to talk about the last part of her life, the last puzzle piece, and that's the legacy that she left us um, in the Catholic worker houses across the country. So it's a little bit about the last days of her life. She died on the evening of November 29th, 1980. 
Uh, so that's her death day. And um, I'm sure that uh, when she's named a saint someday, that's the day we'll be celebrating um, in terms of our church here. Um, her funeral is held in New York at Nativity. And, and of course, thousands came to, um, to um, you know, to pay, to pay their respects for this incredible, incredible woman who had started um, this, this revolution of love, um, really founded on the Sermon on the Mount and, and Matthew 25. Um, something she has left behind then are a number of Catholic worker houses. And as I said, there's about 250 of them all over the United States. Not one of them is the same. Um, and I just wanted to show you just some of them that I have been, um, have been to personally. Um, and again, if you're in a city um, in the U US and you just Google if they've got a Catholic worker house, chances are they do. And to make a visit there um, sometimes can be kind of a, a, a neat thing. So um, this particular house is called the Jean Donovan house. Jean Donovan was a woman who was killed in um, uh, Nicaragua back in the 1970s. And um, so in St. Cloud, Minnesota, they named this Catholic worker house after Jean Donovan. And when I was in college at St. John's, I was able to go and have, have dinner there. And um, it was, and then after college, worked for a bit in St. Cloud. And, and that's where I began to think, began to learn more about Dorothy Day, but also to have this kind of this idea of, you know, someday, someday, wouldn't it be interesting to um, form a Catholic worker house as well? Um, when I was out in Hartford, Connecticut on a service trip one year back in uh, 1994, I uh, went to a Catholic worker house, this house, um, and uh, uh, the, they, they specialized in just welcoming people, having some programs, a few people live there, um, uh, really, really um, peaceful, peaceful place. Um, Tukasa is a Catholic worker house on the south side of Chicago. And their specialty, their their um, uh, their their mission is to welcome uh, the immigrants, welcome primarily Hispanic, uh, Latino people, and so um, I was able to go there a few times and do some do some work and do some uh, little light construction for them. Uh, that's in Chicago, uh, Catholic Worker House in St. Louis, Missouri, is called Karen House. It's this um, grand. Uh, corner um, convent um, next to a church. And their main mission was to and is to um, house young moms and their children. And so um, the second floor is primarily housing, the first floor is dining room and um, uh, other types of meeting rooms and such. Uh, but their mission was to, to reach out to the poor, especially the, the young moms and, and children. And then uh, La Crosse, um, right in in your own diocese, there um, has a place called the Place of Grace, started by uh, by Tom Thibodeau over at Viterbo. It's uh, 25 years old. They have regular uh, meals and programs and and such there. Um, uh, very peaceful place. If you ever get to get get a chance to go to that um, place, that's in in La Crosse, kind of down in the heart of the city. In Amro, so they're not all in big cities. Amro is uh, ten miles west of Oshkosh, a little town of, of um, oh about uh, two thousand people or so, I believe. Um, they have a house of hospitality called Casa Esther, and they too, just like um, the place in Southside Chicago, their main mission is to Hispanic and Latino um, uh, people, immigrants, and um, Father Joe Matern. Uh, does a great job with with uh, that ministry at Casa Esther, <clears throat> and so for many many years we kept saying in Green Bay we would sure like to have a house of hospitality um, to have a place where people could come and be welcomed no matter who they are welcomed as Christ, and so we we had a lot of fits and starts and stops and um, just could never seem to pull it together until. Uh, the fall of 2019, and we um, purchased this house on the west side of Green Bay. It's a big old Victorian. Um, I was just over there. I, I cut this call a little close because we had a, a piano that was delivered from Eau Claire. A woman in Eau Claire wanted to donate a baby grand piano uh, to the place, and so it just got delivered there. We see this um, this house as a place of peace, a house of 
um, where all are welcome, no matter who you are, no matter uh, what your beliefs or what your background or which, whoever you are, um, you're welcome there. And it's uh, sponsored by an organization that we call Whatsoever You Do. And Whatsoever You Do is an umbrella for um, five programs, five outreach programs. And just kind of quickly, Street, street Lights Outreach started as a street ministry in Green Bay. Um, and uh, it is, is an outreach to those who are on the streets. Um, now provides uh, picnics in the park during the summer times uh, for people on the streets and people in low and no income housing. Um, and so Street Lights Outreach is a program that's sponsored by that organization in the middle called Whatsoever You Do. We started a, a bike program for homeless folks in Green Bay called Spokes of Hope. And so we center it out of um, the St. Vincent de Paul store. And uh, we've got a bike shop that fixes um, bikes for free and gives away bikes for free um, to those who need them. Amani Outreach is a, a program for seniors that um, uh, provides simple home adjustments for seniors and those with disabilities and um, all done for free. Uh, uh, people that need light bulbs changed and smoke alarm batteries and simple home fix-ups and, and a listening ear. Uh, that's what Amani Outreach does. We have a giving garden, a, a community garden that grows vegetables and uh, for uh, low and no income folks in our community and shelters and other uh, service programs. And then Spirit Way is a uh, kind of a multidimensional um, program, but uh, consists of some spiritual direction, but also some online tools, uh, video reflections that we do each week to help people um, reflect on their spirituality and on their faith. So all of those programs are housed within whatsoever you do. And we uh, believe that that house of hospitality um, serves as a springboard for all of these programs, but also a place where people can come and gather for meals and programs and such um, once we've encountered them in these outreach programs. So, um, so we, we dreamt so many years of having a house of hospitality devoted to Dorothy Day in her memory. And uh, in 2019, we were finally able to pull it off in um, uh, late 2019, we had Dorothy Day's granddaughter, uh, Martha Hennessy, at the house for dinner. Um, and uh, it was amazing having her sit at the table of this house of hospitality. Looks just like her grandmother, younger, you know, but uh, same kind of hairstyle, same facial features. And uh, it was just incredible to have Dorothy's granddaughter uh, dine with us and break bread and talk about Dorothy's life. So um, we've been pretty blessed in, in uh, Green Bay because Dorothy has blessed us with this vision um, of welcoming each person as Christ who comes to our door. And that's what we strive to do. So um, that's, um, I'm going to stop uh, sharing screen here. Um, that's what I have for you tonight before we end in prayer, but what I would do is welcome any um, questions that people have. Um, you can either put them in the chat box, or if you're online here with us, you can unmute yourself and just ask questions or give comments, whichever you'd like to do. We have just a, a few minutes here to, um, to have any discussion that you'd like to have. So any comments, any questions that you have about Dorothy's life? I just want to thank you. It was a great presentation. Lots of great information. It's nice to know that we have some of these hospitality houses in Wisconsin. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and that's not all of them. Uh, Milwaukee just opened up another one. I think they have two down there now, um, uh, just recently within the last year or so. So there's a couple down there. Um, yeah, like I said, there's the one in Amaro, one in La Crosse, one in Green Bay now. So um, they're around, but you can also hit Chicago and Minneapolis and Davenport, Iowa, and, you know, lots of other places as well. So thanks. Yeah. Anything else? I, I, as I said last time, um, the American Prophet series is built on the fact that there are people who have been prophetic in our country as models of faith. 
have have shown us how to live as Christ, have told us how to live as Christ, have modeled how to live as Christ. And um, last time we talked about Thomas Merton doing that. This time we talked about uh, Dorothy Day. And both of them have that same, um, as I said, that same um, kind of dimension to them, that they had some early years that were a little unsettled, um, had some conversion in their life, and then did some amazing things. And I think um, both of them uh, can serve as such great models for us because, because none of us are perfect, right? And holiness is a is a, just a human journey that we're on. So that's what I that's what I most appreciate about Dorothy and about Thomas is just the humanness that they have. So I do have some in the chat line here. Um, how can we keep Dorothy from being dismissed and instead share her message of social action in the church? Um, you know, I would say keep holding up the fact that um, that there is this social dimension to the gospels, right? That um, I always tell people, if you read the scriptures with the lens of social justice on, not just the, not just the gospels, but the Old Testament as well. You, if you put it this way, if you read the scriptures from cover to cover, which I don't recommend doing it quite that way, but you know, if you did, um, and have the lens of social justice of, and and how do you know you have that lens on? Make sure that you pay attention to words like poor, stranger, alien, widow, children. Those are all. Um, marginalized people in the scriptures, right? And through the Old Testament, the Israelites had this incredible um, care for, for those people, for the poor, for the children, for the widow, for the stranger, for the immigrant, okay? And then that carries right into the New Testament where Jesus says, you know, let's ramp it up even a little bit more because it's all about love, right? So based in the scriptures is this belief that we are called to love. And so Dorothy gives us not just an example of someone who converted, which is fine and good, and it's a great story, and it's a, you know, we're all called to conversion, right? But that she she spoke and not only spoke, but acted with incredible courage, so much so that she was jailed a number of times. Um, she took part in um, uh, civil defense uh, demonstrations continuously, year after year after year for so many years, um, that she was, she was always seemingly in trouble with um, church leaders, with civil leaders. Um, and, and so I think... To, you know, if you hear people talk about um, only about, you know, this notion that that Bob oh, Dorothy had this abortion and then she had this great conversion experience. And well, I was not great about her to also draw to mind for people that she was also one of the greatest examples of Christ's love that we had in the 20, 20th century. And that when Pope Francis came to the United States addressed Congress in um, uh, what year, uh, 2013, I think, 2015, 2015. Um, he, he held up four people as models for, for us um, to emulate. One was Abraham Lincoln. Another was Martin Luther King Jr. Another was Thomas Merton. And another was Dorothy Day. And so Pope Francis lifting up Dorothy as a person who gave us this model of social action. I don't know that you could have a better spokesperson and cheerleader than that. So we too can, we too can um, stand up for Dorothy as well. So you're going to hear a lot more, I think, about her as, as the time goes on, as, as miracles are discovered, you know, that are attributed to her, um, that she moves towards uh, beatification and canonization. You'll hear more about her life. Um, but I think every time you do or hear somebody talk about her, to just remember and recall and to remind that she 
at the at the base of it, at the base of everything she did, she was about relationships and she was about love of the poor and those on the margins. And how can you do better than that? So anything else? I want to close with um, a prayer that's been written for the canonization of, of Dorothy Day. Um, and this is on the um, on her uh, the Dorothy Day uh, Society website. And so we'll close in prayer tonight um, as we leave. And then I just I, I'll do a little commercial after this prayer. God our Father, your servant Dorothy Day exemplified the Catholic faith by her life of prayer, voluntary poverty, works of mercy, and witness to the justice and peace of the gospel of Jesus. May her life inspire your people to turn to Christ as their savior, to see his face in the world's poor, and to raise their voices for the justice of God's kingdom. We pray that her holiness may be recognized by your church, and that you grant the following favor that we humbly ask through her intercession. And I'll just pause for anybody to just kind of remember in your heart, any person or any cause that you'd like to pray for. We ask this through Christ our Lord, amen. amen. So just a little commercial um, on April 7th, 6.30 to 8 again, um, we will have the conclusion of the American Prophets series. And on that night, we are going to cover not just one person, but three people. So you get triple, you know how they old, uh, the old gum commercials were double the pleasure, right? It's going to be triple the pleasure because we are going to have three people. Abraham Joshua Heschel, who is arguably the greatest Jewish um, theologian the United States has ever seen. Um, so truly an American prophet of the 20th century. Uh, Fannie Lou Hamer, who some of you may not have ever heard about, but uh, an African-American woman from the South who um, has a lot to teach us. And then Henry Nouwen, the, the, great, um, the great theologian, philosopher, speaker, motivational person, uh, who lived with those on the margins, especially those who were um, uh, disabled. So uh, we'll have three people, Heschel, Hamer, and Nowen. And so um, hope that you can come back for that. That's on April 7th. Mark your calendars and uh, get registered up. And um, hopefully I'll be able to be in Marathon and enjoy that, that retreat center that I love coming to. Um, and uh, hopefully you can too. But if not, we'll certainly make it available uh, through Zoom as well. So in the meantime, stay safe in that snow that you're getting in central Wisconsin and um, happy shoveling. I heard it's going to be a wet, heavy snow. Not that snow you can blow away this time, uh, but a more wet, heavy snow. So be safe and be well, and we'll see you on April 7th. Adele, anything to add? Yep, I'm here getting feedback, but um, Adele is making a change of scenery. This is called live TV. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is low production right here, folks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> can you hear me? I think we can. Okay. Well, thank you again, Tony. Um, Dorothy, I've known about her for a long time and it's just been very fun listening and um, learning some new things about her. And wow, what a courageous person. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, thank you for giving a better spiel than I would about April 17th. <laughs> and then um, we're taking March off for Lent. However, we have a different offering and it's going to be more of a dialogue. Um, I will be facilitating and it's going to be offered in person and virtual. Um, it's called Who's My Neighbor? And it's based on Fratelli Tutti, the encyclical by Pope Francis. It's a six week series on 
Thursdays. It begins a little bit before Ash Wednesday. And I don't have the date right here, but it's um, the last Thursday in February. And then it goes to the week before Holy Week. Um, 9.30 in the morning to 11, as well as 6.30 p.m. to 8 o'clock at night to give both day and evening options for folks. So you can call the office or send an email to get registered for that. Um, that's all. I just I add a plug so, to that, Adele. Can I add a plug? Last last Lent, we uh, covered for Telly Tutti here in Resurrection Parish. It's one of the. It's one of the easiest, best, easiest, uh, best read um, encyclicals. Now I know we're getting feedback. Um, you'll love the encyclical. So come and join the discussion. It's going to be fantastic. And, and that's the whole point. We, we want a discussion. So it, we'll be reading and then talking about it. And hopefully we'll get different points of view. Um, yeah. So Thank you all again for those who are watching virtually and those who are here in person. And Tony, thank you so much. It's You're always welcome. just very fun to have you here in person or virtual. So You're welcome. be safe, everybody, and be well. All right.